back to The Bulwark Goes to Hollywood. My name is Sonny Bunch. I'm cultural editor at The Bulwark. And uh, I'm very pleased to be joined today by Eric Nelson. Eric is the vice president and editorial director at Broadside Books. Uh, he has been there since he's been at Harper since 2017. And I, uh, I'm very excited to have him on today because I, I wanted to talk to Eric about something that's very interesting to me. Um, and maybe, maybe you know, people don't quite understand this, but there are lots of conspiracy theories about book sales. Um, there, are, there are lots of people who simply don't believe that certain, certain people could sell a certain number of books. Uh, and this is very amusing to me because Eric uh, is the editor on two recent bestsellers, one of which by, uh, is by my, my colleague and my friend, uh, Tim Miller, his book about you know, his kind of time uh, of horror as Trump comes to comes to power. Great book. Yeah, everybody should check it out. Um, and uh, also Jared Kushner's new book, another bestseller, uh, obviously a very different point of view than than my friend Tim's. Um, but, uh, you know, equally, maybe not equally, maybe maybe much more popular. Who, who could say much less popular? And this is one of the questions uh, that I have for Eric, because book sales are kind of a black box, not really a black box, but a blackish box, right? We don't have like box office numbers that say, okay, here's how much money a movie made. Um, and it goes out to everybody and everybody can, you know, check it out on variety every week. Instead, we have bestseller lists that are kind of informed by book scan, but not really. Explain this to folks who don't really understand how book sales work and how they're tabulated and how they are kind of, uh, how, how these bestseller lists are created. Okay, so the uh, Publishers Weekly list is that list that you think doesn't exist. The Publishers Weekly list is it's it's not just informed by BookScan; it's just the BookScan list. And BookScan is the Nielsen ratings company, you know, that does TV. They also do a point of purchase system where they count every book that's sold through a major retailer and most of the independent retailers. So whether you buy in the grocery store. Or at you know the uh, a bookstore in your small university town, um, it, it goes into BookScan and then Publishers Weekly publishes their bestseller list and they'll say, you know, this week Jared Kushner's book sold forty six thousand two hundred and thirty one copies, and you can actually look at that for yourself. So that's the PW list, and the Wall Street Journal list is also, uh, um, it's also from BookScan, so it. It's always the same as the PW list, even though it pretends like it's a separate product. Um, and then there's the New York Times list, which is no one knows how it gets made. I mean, there are we have sales analysts who have put countless hours into trying to reverse engineer it to figure it out what it is. Part of what skews it is is that um, it comes out every Wednesday night uh, around five o'clock and. If everyone else is delayed because Barnes & Noble is like, we had a computer crash and we can't submit our numbers this week, um, they'll all delay while they wait to hear from Barnes & Noble. And the New York Times is like, oh, here's our list. So the, the, there's no one really quite knows. Um, what the book, what the New York Times list does explicitly say they are is a list of the best-selling books um, that their readers would be interested in. So they feel free to exclude books because they don't feel like this is the right sort of, you know, it doesn't fit into any of the categories. For a long time, they left out religion books. They had a religion bestseller list, and then they got rid of it, and then they just didn't include religion books at all. And then now they sort of include religion books. And there are lots of books they don't include. 1984 by George Orwell. There, there hasn't been a week in my lifetime that it isn't one of the 15 best-selling fiction paperbacks in the country. Um, but... It's old, so they don't count it. Um, if they did a new special edition, m maybe it would come up, but um, as long as they're just uh, an old book, it doesn't count. So theirs is an editorial product that they are that they are um, putting out, and it seems like they heavily weight independent bookstores and then brick and mortars, real uh, regular bookstores um, like Books a Million and Barnes and Noble, and then Target, and then Amazon the least. Uh, which is where um, frequently there's the uh, there's a, a sort of conservative conspiracy theory, which the New York Times just leaves them off um, out of out of malice and spite. Um, and that's not true. What happens is, is that usually they just get downgraded or not included because remember, if you're counting Amazon less than everywhere else, nobody is buying um, Jared Kushner's book 
at an independent bookstore in a university town, right? The, everyone who's buying is buying on Amazon. When you have someone, you know, like um, like Tucker Carlson or Sean Hannity, a lot of those books are going to places that don't even have a Barnes and Noble. You know what I mean? They're going all over Tennessee, and I don't know how many Barnes and Nobles there are in Tennessee, but in <laughs> the, outside of uh, yeah. the three urban areas, probably not very many. Um, so, so what happens is all those books are just the New York Times has specifically created a system where if you're um, you know, a, a book about tech, especially, um, as another area where people mostly buy it on Amazon, um, then, and aren't going to bookstores, some sorts of business books, those things all tend to get counted less than other books on the New York times list. I, yeah, to, I, to, to clarify something, when I say that, that the, you know, the, the bestseller list of just pure numbers doesn't really exist. It, what I mean more is that it is, it's not, and maybe I'm wrong here. This is just my understanding. It is not something a, a publisher is not likely to put publishers weekly bestseller on the cover of their their book. Right. It's like New York Times bestseller. That's what that's what yeah. everybody wants. Everybody wants New York Times bestseller. Maybe they'll or, put Wall Street Journal bestseller on there. But yeah. it's like that's that's the stamp. Right. That's like yeah. the number one it, thing. If it's businessy, you might put Wall Street Journal bestseller on it. Um, if it's romance, they often put USA Today bestseller on it. Um, and then for the rest of the industry, we have a thing called a national bestseller, which you've probably seen on a lot of book covers. And the sort of unwritten rule is um, it makes two bestseller lists. You can call it a national bestseller. So if it's on USA Today, NPW, if it's on the Wall Street Journal um, and it's on the L.A. Times regional list, you can call it a national bestseller. That's sort of a leftover from when um, the Post and the L.A. Times and the San Francisco Chronicle um, – they used to all have local bestseller lists where they canvassed local um, stores and put what their local bestseller was. And that's why if you were a bestseller in Washington and LA Times, you're a national bestseller. But now everyone uses it um, you know, for, for a book that didn't make the Times, a, a book that should have and did not make the Times, will say national <laughs> bestseller on the front. Yeah. Uh, I, I, you, you mentioned something very interesting, and I want to I want to drill down on that for a second. Uh, the the idea that 1984 should be on every bestseller list every every week that it's constantly how many uh, how many how many classic books are like that? If you if you looked at the the actual just pure number of books sold, uh, how often would the fiction bestseller list just be dominated by? 1984, yeah. you know, I, I don't know, like Atlas Shrugged, you know, like the kind of the books that sell a ton that everybody everybody talks about all the time. But, you know, you, you don't want to have the same list every week. You can you can just look at um, the top 100 on Amazon and see it. And um, it, 1984 is always in there. And the other book um, is the American Psychological Association's like uh, handbook for for writing like it's it's how to appropriately footnote things and um mm -hmm. according to the american psychological association those are both always in the amazon 100 and but but don't make the new york times bestseller list um i don't know how many of the other ones there are 1984 is the one uh, there's um i'm not sure it's happening with tolkien right now but that's an example where mm -hmm. because of the new show um i would bet that the well, now's a little bit of a weird time for the paperback fiction list, but I, which I can go into for a minute. But um, normally, like those wouldn't count. But then if you do a new edition, that's a movie tie-in edition, then it counts. And then sometimes the New York Times will count all of the different ISBNs as what, to put one of them onto the list, and sometimes it doesn't. And so it's it's hard to figure out whether or not they're going to include um, something that has a bunch of different editions or not. Right now is a particularly weird moment, though, because of Colleen Hoover, which is not a um, – I mean, you've maybe read some book talk stories, which is like mm -hmm. TikTok has made a bunch of books popular. But Colleen Hoover is sort of in a um, uh, like Hunger Games, um, Harry Potter kind of space, like level of sales is just every week. She dominates the whole list with all of her books. And so there's no room for anything else because Colleen Hoover is this massive cultural 
But you, you and I are like middle-aged white guys, so we don't, right. so we don't, we're not reading Colleen Hoover or talking about it. But, um, but and and it's um, two, like my kids are not the age to be reading Colleen Hoover, but it is, it's a huge cultural phenomenon that does not get discussed anywhere. That Colleen Hoover is yeah. is the most important writer in America right now that you've never heard How of. How many? I mean, I mean, how many invisible, uh, massive sellers like that are? I mean, and when I say invisible, I mean invisible to the general cultural conversation. Yeah, you know, because I, for instance, I was, um, I was looking up some some stats uh, for a recent piece I was writing about anime, and there's a there's a author of uh, manga style comics who uh, I like the the dog dog man, you know, dog cop. I I don't know, like just millions and millions of copies. Yeah. And nobody ever took nobody in the in the again in the like uh, elevated cultural conversation ever talks about this, but it's huge. Yeah, I mean, it's funny when you look at um, the list of top ten bestsellers every year, um, and there's always like one person in there that you're like, who? I remember going through this with um, with uh, uh, it was a more perfect union, and he wrote "Gifted Hands." He was uh, the the neurosurgeon who served under Trump. Why am I blanking on his name? Oh, uh, Ben Carson. Ben Carson. Ben Carson. At the point that he he was uh, he was running for it was before he ran for president, and I would have conversations with people where I would say I worked at the time at um, at Sentinel, which published him, and I'd say, and we have Ben Carson, and I would get a blank stare from people in the industry, and I would say, hit. His book is currently number one on the nonfiction list, and I would get a blank stare. It's like, and it has been for four consecutive weeks, and I would get a blank stare. It's just like, the it's just sort of, liberals would look at the list, and just skip past that one. It's like they just didn't bother to process it. And then when he when he ran for president, it was suddenly popular. People were like, who is this guy? And I was like, this guy is one of the ten best selling writers in America right now. You just don't care. I mean, there's a book that we did yeah. called The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck, maybe five or six years ago now. And um, it's uh, at some point, it, it's, it must be entering in the like top 10 self help books of all time. And it has like no wider cultural uh, effect. But the book, um, I, I we probably have, like five or six million copies now. I mean, it's there's just nothing like it. It's it's the number one nonfiction book every year, and people. Yeah. If you're not if you're not a guy buying this guy, if you're not somebody buying this guy's book, um, you don't notice it. It's just it, it's weird I, how things can stay under the yeah. radar. I mean, it, it, the the number you throw out there, five or six million. I, just for for context, I, I I think on your on your Twitter feed recently, you said that the threshold for a New York Times bestseller is something like twenty to twenty five thousand copies. Well, that, that that's, right? yeah, I mean, that's, that's life. That's how long a, a New York Times bestseller sells ever in hardcover. Right. Um, the threshold depends on the time of year. Um, in the fall, it's probably for a hardcover, um, about 6,000 copies in hardcover gets you on the bestseller list. Um, and, uh, but like in August, there was a week this year where there was a book that made the list with 1,400 copies in hardcover was all it had sold. And for the nonfiction list, I mean, nonfiction paperback is not a real category. People just don't care. People don't buy books and non nonfiction books and paperback. And so really sometimes the list will go to, yeah, sometimes the list will fall to like, there'd be a book that sold 700 copies on the nonfiction list. Well, part of this is, is, and this is, I mean, if you have some real economic wonks out there, they'll uh, enjoy this. When I started publishing in 1997, $25 was the price of a hardcover. And um, that's like $55 now. And because $25 is still the standard price for hardcover, and you're buying it on Amazon, you know, for $18.99. So books have gotten insanely cheap. And so you can imagine why there was a paperback market for books. If a hardcover book was $55, um, it totally made sense to wait for it to come out and buy it in paperback. But the price differential now between paperbacks and hardcovers is, um, is so small that people don't bother buying paperbacks. It's a pretty rare book. Now, fiction is different because fiction sends a market signal. 
people see books in paperback and um, they, they just, it means something to them when they see a fiction book and paperback about the genre and about, you know, what, what it's for. It's, it's, yeah, it's, that's, that's so interesting to me. I had never really thought about that, but I, it makes makes some sense. Has has the Kindle uh, and you know to I guess probably to a lesser extent the Nook replaced the the paperback market at all for 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 nonfiction? Yeah. So this was um, uh, there were there were mass market. What it replaced was mass market. There were mass market imprints at the major houses that essentially been dismantled and everyone laid off over the past ten years because. Um, those were people who were – there were very few people who were um, price sensitive and not quality sensitive, right? I mean the biggest price for you in reading a book is the time you have to spend reading it, right? The actual cost of the book is immaterial compared to am I really ready to devote three weeks right. to reading sure. only this book? And so um, – but there are people who read um, – sort of science fiction and a certain kind of crime book and um and a lot of uh genre um romance novels that were not price sensitive they they were used to getting the books free at a spinning thing in the library like leave one leave a romance take a romance and so those people flock to the inexpensive um kindle books but but then once they had wiped out the mass market um we didn't see much of an increase so like all the publishers except for random house went all in on like ebooks of the future and random house partially because the guy who runs it started as a printer and so has like in his heart a love for print and ink and didn't buy that people were going to what we've actually seen is digital audio is the format the life-changing format that ebooks never turned out to be digital audio um is for for a lot for for certain kinds of books can be as much as 50 percent of the market i have a book um that came out that's been a, a big success for us called the end of the world is just the beginning and um it's a ve- it's a businessy book but it's a very like red team um out there kind of book about the, the shape of the world for the next 50 years by a geographer. And, um, and every week we're now, we're selling like 70% of our units every week in digital audio. When you say digital audio, you mean like audiobook, like audiobooks. Audible yes. Or, yeah. Yeah. Et, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. Audiobook. Uh, yeah. I mean that, that's interesting. And that tracks with frankly, my experience. I, you know, sometimes, uh, some of my podcaster friends yell at me because I've not listened to their podcast, but that's because when I'm at the gym, the only time I have to listen to stuff is at the gym, basically. I, you know, because I'm either reading or working or writing the rest of the time, watching movies or TV shows, whatever. Uh, when I'm at the gym and I can, you know, get on the elliptical and do my hard, hardcore, uh, you know, 40 minutes of cardio uh, two or three times a week, that's when I listen to things. But I listen to audiobooks because they are like, they're just better. I mean, they're just, they're just better to, to do. I, I don't know. Uh, it's interesting that yeah. that is a thing that I'm sorry, I'm rambling now, but that's no. a thing that tracks that. I yeah. I think, you know, now what speed do you listen to audiobooks on? I, I listen to, uh, well, it depends. It, see, it's, it's interesting. It depends if I'm listening to something that is narrated by a person I know. So, or am familiar with. So like, for instance, uh, I'm currently listening to a Bruce Campbell book. Um, I listen at one time speed because I like their, but if it's somebody I don't know, it's usually at 1.25 or even 1.5. Yeah. So the, I think this is a big part of why people started switching over to digital audio is the higher speed. So I, I have a couple, I love John Sanford and I love his audio books, the, the, uh, the police procedural writer. And when I get those, you know, I listen to it slow and, and wallow in it. But if I'm like reading a history of the 20th century, yeah, I'll list it on one and a half, even 1.75 speed, um, because I'm just trying to get the, I'm just trying to squeeze all of the juice out of the lemon as fast as I can. Yeah. And so I think there are a lot of people, that's why we see business books is a huge category for that because people are just trying to, you know, they just want this biography of Elon Musk and they want to have it downloaded into their brain as soon as possible. Do you guys get the data on that? How fast people listen to it? Two, no, two things. Nope. That's why I yeah. asked because it's not 
it's it's anecdotal is the best research I can do. Yeah, no, that's interesting. Uh, you know, everybody complains about the lack of information. Um, I, since we're talking about uh, uh, Audible and and Amazon uh, for a second, I want to I want to ask uh, you know one thing people suggest is that people game the Amazon purchase system by buying in bulk. But that's hard, right? Yeah, it, it's it's really hard to do, but because um, I've had authors reach out to me and they because they start buying in bulk, and I mean bulk by they're like by order twenty five copies um, through Amazon, and often because through it's actually cheaper for them to order from Amazon than order from us because we are giving them a big discount, but we're charging them for shipping. So if they have Prime, they're like, it's, I will order my own books from Amazon. Um, and then they'll get limited to five books and then no more. And one of the reasons is that um, Amazon worries that that it's a bot who is leveraging an improper pricing. This actually happened once with sh- um, salt, heat, acid, fat. Um, that somehow Amazon accidentally priced it at like three ninety nine, and it's like a forty dollar book, and immediately went to number one on Amazon. And no one was even sure like it. Uh, it eventually they people were buying it to have the book but people were pretty mm-hmm. sure that it was a bot who was who was buying all the copies um and that at least got it drove it into the top 100 because it was you know buying them and reselling them back yeah on, sure on amazon somehow well there are yeah like arbitrage like yeah. they're buying yes. it for four dollars and selling it for ten dollars yeah. you know instead of 40 when when the price goes back up yeah interesting so um so it's it's hard to do that and then also um I don't, I don't think that Amazon would allow you. If you bought twenty five hundred copies from Amazon, I don't think it would send you to number one on Amazon. And that's that's enough copies in twenty four hours to get you to Amazon sometime to number one. Sometimes, I don't think Amazon would do it. I think that they would count each purchase um, as one purchase for the point of the ranking system. There's this. Mm-hmm. There's no reason to think. And then one of the things is we can see um hourly sales for books and so um if if jared kushner bought five thousand books um you know at 7 a.m on a monday we could just see in our system oh somebody bought 2500 copies right at 7 a.m because what we do see is like he he um he went to number one on amazon the first day that his uh, the day before his book went out because he did um, Life, Liberty, and Levin on Fox, which is the absolute best place to sell books. And Levin said, this is the definitive story of the Trump administration. You're not going to find a better book, which is like what you hope a host would say on air mm-hmm. when, about a book. And um, and we could see that halfway through the show, um, we started selling thousands of copies. And then like by midnight, it had tapered off. But we were selling... We once for Peter Schweitzer, we once sold eighteen thousand copies in one hour after Mark Levin aired because um, he did a whole hour and just everybody who saw the show, it seems like, went and bought a copy. <laughs> I'm I'm really interested. So this is one of the reasons why I wanted to to have you on. One of the reasons I I started actually talking to Tim Miller about this because this very this very stat about Mark Levin is is fascinating to me. Um, in terms of in terms of the, uh, and you don't feel, I, I don't want you to name names here because I don't want you to get in trouble with any bookers or shows or anything. But in terms of the, uh, the, the, the quality of hits, when you, are, when you as an editor are looking at where do we want to get our folks, uh, obviously the, the Mark Levin TV show, huge, huge seller. Uh, where else are you looking? And like what just doesn't really matter from your POV? So the 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 best things to sell books are um, your the things that get there's a movers and shakers list on Amazon right which is books that have suddenly selling a lot more copies than they were just hours ago and the, when you see something on that list it's from a very small number of places it's from um, prime time uh, talk TV it's from daytime talk TV you know the View. Um, it's from mm-hmm. a morning show, which could be Talking Heads TV or the regular morning shows. Um, it can be um, uh, 
uh, one of a handful of NPR shows that are national. And it can be from a daily New York Times review, a daily Wall Street Journal review, um, or the author's own efforts. They have a newsletter, they have a podcast, um, something to that effect. If, it, if it's not in the list I just gave you, I don't know that it's really going to move. It's going to be a book booking that gets you on the bestseller list. I mean, cumulatively, we still, you know, want to have as me- much coverage as possible for a book. But you can do um, a ton of podcasts and, you know, the, the Federalist could write nine articles in one day about you. Oh, I'm sorry. Breitbart should be on the list. Bre- uh, if Breitbart really says your book is a must-have book, then it will um, – then it will shoot up on Amazon. Um, yeah. That, but that's the only website I know of that has that ability to get people to move like that. Um, so, but par- there's also a difference though in the quality of the hits. Because the thing is, like, why does Terry Gross sell books? And the answer is because the people who who listen to Terry Gross are listening to think, okay, am I going to buy the book by the person who's on Terry today? That's what they think before it even starts. Um, Mm -hmm. and then, uh, you know, Rachel Maddow's show, um, used to sell a crazy amount of copies, um, and Tucker Carlson's show can sell a crazy amount of copies, but Jake Tapper's show does not. And the reason isn't just the total number of viewers, it's how they handle the book segment. When Tucker and Rachel do a segment, they're like, this new book is the news. And to know about the news, you have to read this book. And Jake Tapper is like, we have a guy here today who's written a book about China. And he asked him a book about China. He's like, all right, now, you know, is Biden doing a good job of handing China? Let's throw it to the panel. And they bring up six heads and kick it around. And it doesn't yeah. it doesn't communicate to readers that the book is the news. And so one of the things for, um, you know, uh, Levin is that he will sometimes do two or three segments or even an entire show around a book or a personality. And then that's, that's what sells an insane number because you could imagine if, um, for anyone, if like Laura Ingram was like tonight, I just have one guest and we're going to spend an hour talking face to face with Lauren Boebert about her new book. Then Lauren Boebert's book would just fly off the shelves because all of Laura Ingram's viewers would be like, Oh, this book is major that she just devoted an hour and, you know, it's really in depth and interesting. So, yeah, that's the, that's that's interesting. So, uh, you know, one thing one thing uh, back when I uh, was working in kind of more mainstream conservative uh, uh, news that we would always talk about is, look, conservative books sell more conservative, conservative, conservative books sell sell at higher levels. And, you know, we, we would always say, oh, well, conservative conservatives are really readers. You know, that that is always a thing that that we would talk about is that still true do you find um that conservative conservative branded books sell sell better than you know liberal branded books and i'm curious to get your sense of why that is um there there's a there are a couple different things one i think often um there are books that are liberal that we the liberals aren't counting right so um like if brian kilmeade writes a book about george washington um that's a conservative book. And then, um, but if Jonathan Alter writes a book about George Washington, that's just a book about George Washington. So some of it is there's a purposeful branding of one is liberal and not because of this sort of bias. Um, a second thing is that um, the conservatives tend to be much more naked in just how they pitch the product, right? So it's easier to get to the top of the bestseller list Um, with a book that's uh, about that where you're just calling the president a jerk, right? Um, If you're, but one of the, we saw so many Trump bestsellers partially because the left finally was like, I'm going to write a book and I'm just going to call it traitor. Why the president is a traitor. And so for a long time, just conservatives weren't pulling any punches in their packaging and liberals were, and there's still a strong, push for liberals to call their books like, you know, the democracy paradox, why our future is at risk from part, you know, something where it's just, it's just not as in your face. Um, And then the third thing is, is that 
the the more original the book is, the harder to find this information and argument um, somewhere other than this book, then the better the book is going to sell. So this is why, I mean, Alex Jones is at the top of Amazon right now, and RFK wrote a book that said Fauci killed tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of AIDS patients in the 80s, um, is you can't find that anywhere else. So that's that sells really well. And so one of the things that you're up against when you're doing a liberal book is, um, you know, I, I did a book with Scott Gottlieb that was a bestseller, and we were very proud of how it turned out. It was the best-selling COVID book that took COVID seriously, um, aside from Michael Lewis, who's always the best-selling book on anything. But um, but it was hard. We knew going in selling Scott Gottlieb's book because a book saying, you know, COVID was bad. Here's why it was bad. The vaccine was good. Here's why it was good. Was just what you get every day in almost every media outlet in America. And so he his book was never going to be a massive number one bestseller because um, if you wanted that opinion, you could find it somewhere else. And so one of the things that benefits conservative books is the way that they are marginalized by the rest of the media means that um, if you buy a book by a conservative, you're likely to get things that are harder to, to find. One thing you just said, uh, if you if you wanted that opinion – uh, you could find it somewhere else is very interesting to me. How much how much of book sales do you think is driven by some form of confirmation bias? People trying to find the the argument the arguments that will help them win arguments. One hundred percent. There's literally no other <laughs> thing that drives people to buy books. There's just there's nothing else that buy, there's no other impulse that would lead you to purchase a book. And so I always say for nonfiction books. You want your number one Amazon customer to review, to, to be headline, I always thought this was true, and now I can prove it, right? So sometimes a young editor will be like, I'm doing a biography of Sting, and it's warts and all. And you're like, no. No <laughs> one who buys a biography of Sting wants to know about warts. They want to know that the police were the greatest band – they were the greatest reggae band. They were the greatest prog rock band. They were the greatest pop band. You know, you – you buy that book so you can tell your friends, why don't you own every police album? I have a book that proves Sting is the greatest songwriter and singer in history. That's why you buy that book. And so um, it, that's true for every book. You, you buy a book that's like how to play golf better in 15 minutes. It's because secretly you thought, I'm just 15 minutes away from being an excellent golfer. I just need – someone just needs to tell me the right thing. And then I haven't sort of worked this out for fiction, but I'm positive that it's true for fiction, that that there's like only a dozen fantasies that people bring to books, and then they just pick a genre and then push that fantasy into it. I mean, I know what mine is. Mine is Sherlock Holmes. Every book that I really love has a person who gets away with with being terrible at everything because they are super good at their one thing. <laughs> <laughs> and so I just I'm I I'm very drawn to that in a book. Um, yeah. So I, I confirmation bias is always it. But the, the thing is, but it still has to be they have it has to be. It's not just I always thought this was true, but the thing and now I can prove it and I couldn't prove it before. So I'll get a pitch for someone who's like, I have a book on how open borders are terrible. But and I'm like, where? Who, who is the person who is having – who believes that, who is currently – doesn't have good information to prove that that's true? And so yeah. you have to say – you have to look at every book and say, what are they saying new about this? And often they have to slice it um, not exactly the partisan way. You know what I mean? You have to figure out something where, where not everybody agrees with you, even the people who you would think would agree with you. You know, I mean I've – this guy – Joe Concha has a book coming about out about Biden soon, and part of his spiel is that for conservatives is that Joe Biden is in control of the presidency, and he's doing all the things that he said he would always do, and all the things you don't like are the things that you always didn't like. Um, it's time to admit Joe Joe Biden is the president and a terrible president because, and I, we'll see if it works, but. You know, the if you watch Fox, Fox is like, you know, Joe Biden is essentially a mummy 
whose whose lips are being pulled with strings or a stick or something, and some cabal of people is running the country. And so we'll see if it works, but he's he's trying to, you know, confirm people's opinion that Joe Biden is a bad president, but try to tell them that in a new, a different way than what they've been thinking so far. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's uh, that's that sounds that sounds about right. Uh, let me um, let me uh, pull up the 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 list of myths here. You did you did a you did like a, a I don't know it was seven eight ten tweet thread something like that. Just the, just the list the list of myths, and I want to run through them real quick for folks. Uh, you should be following Eric by the way on Twitter. His handle is at literary Eric. It's just great great stuff if you're interested in um in the uh the business of books uh, and 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 all that stuff again at literary eric go follow him right now um and also if you right, want to so see we... tweets praising jared kushner and tim miller you know and <laughs> yeah, and jonathan you... last and pete hegseth so if you want yeah if you want to be driven it's crazy a, it's... by this is this is my life. This is where this is what I what I'm what I'm what I live with. All right. So uh, all right. So myth number one: you can buy your way onto the bestseller list. We've talked about this a little bit, but uh, what what is what what are the formulas that that these uh, lists use to to try and yeah. stop that? I mean, it, it boggles my mind that people think the New York Times and Nielsen Bookscan would have made no effort to keep people from gaming their way onto the list. Um, and so uh, part of the thing with their complicated way of, of doing the math at the New York Times is to try to eliminate people who buy who could buy their way onto the list. And they leave people off every week who appear to have gotten their sales in some non-fully traditional way. You can look at the PW list with this book scan every week and compare the two, and there's going to be a book, usually a business book um, – on the PW list that's not on the New York Times list because they have decided the way that this book was bought was um, not right. Or another thing you very commonly see is um, uh, that they have discounted some some bulk sales on the New York Times list um, and where the PW is not. So the PW, it'll be number five in the PW list and it'll be number 12 on the New York Times list because they have somehow feel like they've sorted out the books. So one of the things about the dagger on the New York Times list is um, incredibly misleading because um, they they say that it, it it's went be, this book has had bulk sales, um, but it really appears like it's the books where they've discounted the bulk sales because it, it's the books that tend to be either by politicians or um, business leaders where there are, you know, they go to an event and they sell a thousand copies to the venue having the event. And those books are, are ranked a thousand copies lower than they otherwise would be on the New York Times list. And PW also will leave books off for books for bulk sales. Um, the, the Nielsen book scan list also leaves books off all the time where they have enough units to get on, but they've decided that either because of the geographic spread or the amount sold versus the total amount um, of available inventory that they think something is fishy and they'll leave it off their list. And so they, there used to be people sometimes linked to a book, to, to an article in the Wall Street Journal 11 years ago about a company that you could pay to help you get on the New York Times list. Um, but the New York Times has reformulated their list many times since then, and so has Nielsen Bookscan in an attempt to drive that country company out of business and they sort of did you can't hire that company yeah. anymore to try to do this yeah uh, uh all right so that that's myth number two dagger means he uh, the author bought his way on a uh, myth number three the rnc has a basement full of books yeah this is um uh it, this really started because um don jr uh he had a book that came out from center street and um the rnc bought copies and gave the copies away as a donor premium if you donated $75, right? Um, the, the thing is, um, there, there's a bunch of reasons why this doesn't make any sense. One, his book sold 75,000 copies the first week, and the number two book sold 45,000 copies. So, I mean, he blew away the number two book. There was never the, – the 5,000 copies the RNC bought made no difference to him being number one. 
Two, um, they're often bought through books a million, um, and it's not clear that those count, that, that they're not being excluded. They're likely being excluded from any calculation in the list. And a lot of times, it's not even clear if, Barnes, if Books a Million is reporting those to the Times or Nielsen Book Scan. They often show up very weird. Like Jared Kushner did have some bulk sales. They, they were supposed to appear a certain week. They came out the first week, which we didn't want because we didn't want the dagger and we didn't want – we just said if there's any bulk sales, make sure they're not in the first week so we don't get the dagger. So it's absolutely pristine. They were counted. They got the dagger, whatever. Um, but but the, the RNC actually I, – I had heard that they bought over 15,000 copies of Don Jr.'s book, and they bought them in 1,000-copy tranches over time, which makes sense. I mean, if you've ever been at a nonprofit where they're – using something as a fundraiser, you can just donate $75. Like the RNC is not just randomly mailing people copies of Don Jr.'s book. It's the people who, when that email came out that, okay, this, I'm going to order, I'm going to give $75 and I'm going to get my signed copy mm -hmm. of Don Jr.'s book. Um, and they're also, like I said, often cop buying them in like 1,000 copy tranches. So there's no um, – the there's no reason for them to have them just sitting in the basement. And then people are like, well, it's so the, you know, it's to help Don Jr. with the royalties and it's a way of, but for every $25 book he sells, he's getting like 350 and they can just hire Kimberly Guilfoyle at $60,000 a minute to give a speech. Like if they just want to <laughs> give money to the Trumps. They just give money to the Trumps. It's a terrible way to yeah. give money to the Trumps to, buy 5,000 copies if your intention is to pulp them. Yeah. So that he can, yeah. so that he can get, uh, that he can get 15% of that. Yeah. I mean, this is, uh, th this, we, this is a, a, one of the, the myths later on, um, basically that you can, you can bribe a politician with book sales. Yeah. I had a politician. I had someone try to help me bribe a politician with book sales. Um, I don't even remember who it was, but somebody said, I'm going to have a guy call you. He's this guy. Google him. I Google him. He's like, you know, the 72nd richest person in America. He calls me. He was like, have you ever heard of this congressperson? And I was like, no. And he's like, would you be interested in a book by her? And I was like, probably not. And he was like, what if I was going to buy 20,000 copies? And I was like, well, that's a lot more cartons than you think. <laughs> Like, I hope you have a whole warehouse of somewhere to put those and you don't plan on returning them. Um, and I said, but it, it's not a good way um, for her to make money. So she was a house member. She can't take an advance. And he was like, yeah, but then she can get the royalties from the book. And I was like, well, you know, if you spend one million dollars on books and he's like, I'm not going to spend a million dollars on the book. I was like, OK, great. If you sell one million dollars in books. It's that's going to get her like. 125 whoops sorry 125,000 um dollars to, in royalties like a year and a half from now um minus yeah. the ghost writers like $50,000 so maybe $75,000 for your million dollar spend and he was like oh well fuck that and i was like yeah <laughs> yes exactly and he was like all right well it was very nice talking to you and he hung up and left cuz he was like <laughs> Like when he heard the math, he was like, now it's insane. I could just like hire her husband as a consultant for $75,000. Yeah. Very nice talking to you. Thank, for, thank you for explaining why my bribe would not make sense. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is perfect. Uh, all right. Uh, we, we already discussed you can buy your way to number one on Amazon. Um, and uh, Obama or, or Donald Trump Jr. were bestsellers because of donors. Uh, politicians. Politicians line their pockets this way. Yeah, I mean, this is part of the, um, this is part of the myth about like the the, the bribery thing is that um, that you can that you could get rich doing this. The re the the way that they make any money from doing it is, you know, Ted Cruz is somebody who can appear on Fox, and we just established that Fox is um, very good at selling books. So um, you you get them on Fox. So it's, it's the amount of money that they're making is moderately lucrative, but it's really based on their ability to, to get on TV and having their campaign buy books is, um, and often, you know, if you're a Senator and you get a half million dollars, um, 
remember that the you've got to earn that out before you see anything past the $500,000. And so buying 5,000 copies for your campaign doesn't begin to fill in the bucket of the $500,000, you know, not like a Mark Levin appearance does. So it's so much it makes so much more sense to just get focused on trying to sell books at events and Mark Levin. Yeah. It's kind of like the same with with cheating in elections is like when you look at how much money it would take to bribe people for 10,000 votes, it just makes more sense to try to get 10,000 people to vote instead. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, all right. Speaking of senators, uh, publishing houses give out the advantages in, in exchange for huge favors. And I just want to read the tweet here because it, it, it you know, it's perfect. This one boggles my mind. What valuable benefit could a New York based publishing house possibly get by giving it an advance to Ted Cruz or Elizabeth Warren aside from book sales or bragging rights? Yeah. The, why, why, why? Why do people think this? Yeah. The, um, they're. Yeah, I, I, I think it starts with um, Newt Gingrich got um, some many millions of dollars from HarperCollins. Um, I guess 25 years ago now, and it was investigated by the House Ethics Committee and led to House members not being allowed to get advances. And um, there was some feeling that this was Rupert Murdoch just handing Newt Gingrich millions of dollars. But even at least in that case, um, there's some benefit you could see to if you if you gave Nancy Pelosi or Chuck Schumer a book deal worth an unprecedented number of millions of dollars, you could say they're trying to influence policy. But even then, it's not beneficial to the publishing company. Like maybe there's some, some you know, like Rupert Murdoch would would be passing out money in exchange for having his political beliefs enacted. But like Newt Gingrich is going to do Newt Gingrich stuff, whether Ru Rupert Murdoch gave him money or not. You know, it doesn't it, the 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 where the the publishing company makes out benefiting doesn't make any sense. We, we're not we're not regulated in such a way that it would be that helpful. Like when 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 Andrew Cuomo got his huge advance, if he had somehow allowed us to like deduct biodegradable ink from our state taxes you know, it's worth tens of thousands of dollars. I don't know. I'm like ballparking it here, but there's no, there's nothing that Andrew Cuomo could do for a company that's worth $5 million, except for if he was able to sell, um, you know, right. 1 million copies of his book, which he did not because two of the worst deals yeah. for politician books ever are both Andrew Cuomo. He wrote two books and <laughs> both were phenomenal disasters for their publishing company. <laughs> yeah. That sounds about right. I, I mean, it, this gets to the last the last myth here, which is that politicians are always bestsellers, so there must be a scam. And that that's a myth that, like, I'm surprised people think it because anytime I hear a story about politicians and book sales, it's usually like, well, this politician has drastically underperformed their advance again. Yeah, this is this is this has happened again. And I'm I'm curious from your perspective as an editor, why do why do houses keep making these deals? So, um, I mean, pu publishers do th bad, dumb things all the time. And there was something that every, and you know, it's like an economics 101 thing called um, the winner's curse for auctions, which is that the more people in an auction, the more likely it is that the person who pays the most has grossly overestimated the value of the thing that they're buying. Um, and yeah. so when you have, um, when you have like when Kamala Harris was shopping her book and I, I don't know, there, there was a lot of complications around that. There was a, there was a rumor that she had gotten $2 million and then, but then the deal maybe fell apart. I don't know. That's, it's a little outside of my purview and it was a little secretive, but it was, it was supposedly $2 million was the original amount. And the reason was n not that hard to understand, which is that people thought she had a chance of being president and the person who thought that for $2 million worth was de clear, was delusional. I mean, she could still be president. Joe Biden could be dead while we're talking now, but um, she's not going to get elected on her own. Um, but what happened was that was something where there were, you know, 
like 17 different editors who wanted to bid on it. So then the person who was the 17th dumbest editor is the person who wins it. So, yeah. And, and, yeah. and they're, they, they're famous and they get on TV and, you know, but people make this mistake in the other direction in that, you know, Elon Omar wrote a book, sold nothing. Matt Gates wrote a book and sold nothing. And partially it's because they're like, this person is really famous. Everyone is always talking about them. So their book must be, a bestseller, but it's like if the people talking about you are not your fans, because remember, only your fans are buying things. This idea, this is another thing people do say. It's not in my list of myths, but it's a common one is people will say, authors will say to me like, oh, you'd be surprised how many people hate me and they'll buy the book just to read it to be mad at me. And I'm like, no, they won't. <laughs> There's no evidence in existence that people will buy Jared's Kushner book, Jared Kushner's book, because they hate Jared and just want yeah yeah even the famous new york times yeah yeah no i don't think dwight garner read it i'll go on the record saying that the book has no no, his review has no overlap with the actual book whereas like laura miller and slate hated it but she clearly read the book and hated it on things that they're not the things i would have focused on but i understand why her readers would be like yes i legitimately would hate that about the book yeah. Well, I mean, this is uh, I this gets it to an important distinction between the hate click economy and the subscriber economy. You subscribe to the things you love. You you'll hate click and hate share things that you can read for free and hate. But like that, there the overlap there is not is not uh, particularly good. Yeah, that's why Facebook shares are a much better indicator of potential sales than tweets are. Meaning, you know, if you wrote. Um, if you wrote a piece and uh, and it went viral on Twitter, then you've got um, possibly a book. If you write it and it goes viral on Facebook, you definitely have a book. Because on Twitter, people are sharing things much more negatively, and so you, it could just be everyone dunking on you. Whereas in Facebook, um, people are saying, this thing that Sonny Bunch wrote is me. I want you all to know – my personality is this headline from the bulwark. And so that's, that's, that's a, a much more that's motivating. That's a scary thing. <laughs> it's a much that's more a motivating scary idea. Yeah. Uh, all right. Well, that was, that was everything I wanted to ask. I always like to close these interviews by asking if there's anything I should have asked. If you think there's anything folks should know about the world of book publishing, uh, you know, uh, the intersection of politics and culture and, and books and all that uh, in general, or uh, just you know, I do. Uh, so, so one thing you had started with talking about Tim Miller and Jared, and I've done David Frum and Pete Hegseth, and I've done you know um, people from all across the political spectrum. And the standard that I use for will I publish a book is um, is this commercially viable? There's an audience for it, and will it be filled with true stuff? And that seems like a low bar when I say it aloud, but you know, I, I've had since, since 2020, um, I mean, since 2021, I've had, I forget now, but it's like 15 New York times bestsellers, um, almost all of them conservative and, and none of them alleged the election was stolen. None of them said COVID is a hoax. None of them said, you know, uh, Fauci, is purposely destroying America's public school system to start a, uh, some, you know, a, a great reset or something. And, um, sometimes it feels like I've done all of the conservative bestsellers that didn't say that. Like I've, I'm, I'm <laughs> driving, you know, between two very large, uh, boulders in an attempt to not get crushed by them. And so the reason like Jared's book, um, you could be mad at it, but I think if, if people read it, they'll actually, see an honest person trying to to do their best to reckon with where they were for four years and same for tim miller and you know lou dobbs did a book called the trump century that if you read it you could hate it but you're not going to find that it's filled with you know fake things or you know footnotes that lead to a blog by a dentist so that that's a standard is if it's if it's true and it's you know I think it improves the discourse to do any book that is at least filled with true things and smart arguments. Yeah. Uh, I think that truthfulness and smart, smart, intelligent arguments too, too important 
uh, things, and I'm glad. I'm I look. I'm I hope the you know the book market maintains its equilibrium as we as we see all of the other cultural entities kind of you know uh, have have their issues. Uh, so I'm I'm uh, I'm I'm happy to see books being sold regardless of. Who was writing them? Uh, Eric, thank you very much for being on. I really appreciate it. Um, again, follow him on Twitter at uh, Literary Eric. Uh, check out check out the books that he has edited. Editored edit was the editor on. Uh, and uh, and I, I again, if you haven't, if you're listening to this, you've probably read Tim's book. But if you have not, make sure you pick it up. Again, he was very much the inspiration for this. Yeah, very good whole episode, which I thought was. I thought was fun. Uh, uh, my name is Sunny Bunch. I'm the culture editor at The Bulwark, and I will be back next week with another episode of The Bulwark Goes to Hollywood. We'll see you guys then. Dissecting politics with exclusive interviews, commentary, and humor. Useful Idiots with Katie Halper and Aaron Mate. So Addy Timmermans is banned from coming in contact with a chimpanzee at the Antwerp Zoo in Belgium. Part of what makes this complicated is that he was a pet. Don't be like, oh, it's harming his socialization. Like, that already happened. Honestly, they are getting in the way of their love. I mean, they haven't even gotten to second base. I don't think so. It depends how long the chimp's arms are, though. (laughs) Useful Idiots with Katie Halper and Aaron Mate. Listen wherever you get your podcasts.